called What is Social Studies and How Do We Study It? And so that becomes what we call our essential question. And whenever we are taking Cornell notes, we always write our essential question across the top of our notes because everything in our notes is going to have to do with that topic. So please take time right now to write the question across the top of your notes. The first question we have to ask ourselves, and we will put this question on the left side of the line for our Cornell notes, is what is social studies? I asked this as a learning log question a couple days ago, and it's important to understand what social studies is since you are in a class called Social Studies 6. The dictionary definition of social studies is not something the average sixth grader is going to understand, but I will read it to you anyway. Social studies is the study of social sciences and the humanities to promote civic competence. So we've got three important terms there. The first one is social sciences, the second one is humanities, and the third one is civic competence. Before I tell you what they mean, it might be good for you to try and discuss in your table groups what you think they mean, and we'll see how close you are. First of all, we have social sciences. Social sciences involve the topics of history, geography, economics, psychology, philosophy, anthropology, political science, sociology, law, and religion. And the chances are you probably know what some of those things are, but you probably don't know what all of those things are. And uh, I can pause the video and talk to you about that a little bit. But uh, safe to say before you get out of high school, you're going to be learning quite a bit about most of those topics. And some of those topics you'll have an opportunity to study in depth when you go to college. We also have the humanities. Uh, humanities would be math, literature, and natural sciences. So basically those are your core classes. Um, every single year you're in middle school and pretty much every single year you're in high school, you will always have a math class, you will always have a reading class, and you will always have a science class. Those are what we call the core of our curriculum. And that's why we spend so much time in class learning about those subjects. Finally, we have civic competence, and this is something near and dear to my heart. Competence means proficiency. Proficiency is a word we use a lot at school, basically meaning you know what you're supposed to know and you can prove it. Um, civic means having to do with our day-to-day -day life, participating in government, and being citizens. And if you're not competent in that area, when you do things like voting, uh, you may not make the best judgments. So being civically competent is something we definitely want to encourage, and it's the reason we have social studies classes. So it basically means knowing enough about your world to function and contribute intelligently. And the lower level there is function. It's one thing to function in society, but being able to contribute to society is what we want every citizen to be able to do well. Our next left side question is kind of more up your alley, I think. It's what does the average middle school student think? Yeah. I just threw a lot of big words at you, and I know I threw a lot of big words at you. So the question then becomes, what does this mean to you? You guys are 11 and 12 years old. What does the average middle schooler think? What is social studies? That's a good question. I like to say it's the study of change over time. We don't study what stays the same. That's boring. We know that human beings have always needed to breathe oxygen. That doesn't change, so that's not something we study. However, in early civilizations, we were ruled by kings, and we did what the king said. Now we elect a president and a congress, and we have governors and legislatures and mayors and city councils and sheriff's departments and the FBI and our system of governing ourselves has become a lot more complex. 
How did that happen? Did it happen overnight? History tells us the answer. History is only part of social studies. I think the average sixth grader probably thinks that history and social studies are the same thing. They are not. They, history is a very small part of social studies. Political science is something else that's near and dear to my heart. I do have a degree in it. It's how human government evolved and changed over time. So that question I asked a minute ago about how did kings turn into presidents is a really important one. And it's one that I happen to know a lot about. Um, and it did not happen overnight by any stretch of the imagination. So when you're looking at government and how we run society, that would be the topic of political science. Religion and philosophy are also fascinating topics. And basically they both have to do with human beliefs. Religion has to do with a human belief in God or a deity. And philosophy has to do with human beliefs about life that are not necessarily connected to God or the concept of there being a God. That's the easiest way to um, help you differentiate between those two terms or tell the difference between those two terms. And finally, we have economics, which is also important. That's how do people make, exchange, and sell things? Money has not always existed. So the economic system that you take for granted, where you take money and you go and buy something, is a fairly modern idea. And one of the things we'll be studying this semester is how those systems developed over time. So if we're focusing on history, the, the basic element of social studies, the one that most people commonly think of, the question then becomes, how do we study the past? And that is our new left side question in our Cornell notes. How do we study the past? Well, the first thing we need is evidence. Evidence tells us what happened. And so we have to seek evidence that tells us what happened. And that's where archaeologists come in. Can you all say archaeologists? I knew you could. Archaeologists are people who look for evidence such as artifacts that are left behind by people in the past to give us clues to their lives and the way they lived. And an artifact is basically an object or a thing from the past that helps us to decipher or understand what happened in the past. If you go to an archaeological site, it will often look something remarkably like this. Um, historians also record the past using all of the evidence they have available. So historians need archaeologists to generate the evidence. Historians then create a written record that basically kind of ties all the pieces of evidence together and tells the story that we know as history. And historians also have the power to decide what gets told and what doesn't get told. And that's an extremely important power that historians have. We also have geographers, and I'm a big fan of geographers because geographers are all about maps and understanding not just the physical landscape of the world or what the land is like, but they also are there to decipher the cultural landscape of the world and what the people are like and how the people and the land go hand in hand with one another and work in what we would call, and this is a big fancy word, uh, a synergistic way. The people need the land, the people change the land, um, they have a relationship that is not isolated from each other, but that is intricately interwoven with each other. So geographers are all about the land and what the land is like and the people and what the people are like. So we use some different tools in social studies. So the first thing I want you to write on the left side of the line is what is a timeline? And right here we have a picture of the timeline of an individual person's life. And maybe it would be constructive for us 
to do the same thing. But first, I'm going to tell you what a timeline is. A timeline is a graphic representation of time on a line. So if you've been in math class and you've done a number line, a timeline is very much like a number line, but it has to do with time. It tells you what order things occur in and how much time has elapsed or gone by between certain events. So this particular timeline is talking about from the time someone was born to the time they're 11 years old going into sixth grade. Imagine that. We use timelines to show us when things happened in relation to each other. In other words, what order are they in? How far apart are they? Um, where are they on what we like to call the continuum of time? And a timeline is helpful because it visually shows us history. So we will be using and we will be making timelines this semester. It's time for us to maybe look at some timelines that are in our textbook. And we can find those on pages 64 and 65 of our Geography Alive books. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. And we're going to go ahead and get out our Geography Alive, excuse me, our History Alive Ancient World Textbooks and take a look at pages 64 and 65. And then maybe it'll be fun for us to make a timeline of our lives, and that'll be today's assignment. In social studies, we also have maps, charts, and graphs. And maps, charts, and graphs are extremely important. They really help us to interpret and to understand information. So our next left side question in our Cornell notes is going to be, what do maps, charts, and graphs show us? First of all, maps, charts, and graphs show us visually how things relate to each other. So if you are a visual learner, if you need to see things to understand how they work, maps, charts, and graphs are made for you. Maps use colors and graphics to visually represent a region, an area, a country, a continent, or even the entire planet. Um, they're pretty important because by looking at them, we can make certain judgments or certain inferences as to what an area is like on the surface of the planet. Charts help us to organize data and information in a way that is useful. You can take facts, you can take data, you can take information, you can take numbers, but if you can't organize them in a way that makes sense to the human eye, it's just a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Charts help to take the mumbo jumbo out of the facts and put them in a context that we can understand. Graphs help us to compare and contrast information. Comparing and contrasting is an extraordinarily important skill. It's going to be something we do quite a bit in social studies class, and it's something that graphs really help us to do well. First thing we're going to do now is look at an example of a map on page 34 in your History Alive textbook. So we're going to go ahead and pause the video and take a look at that map. This is a chart. This chart has a lot of information on it. And after I do my little spiel here, I'm going to have you pause the video because we want to know what this chart shows. And we also want to look at the question, how does the way this chart organizes information help us to understand it? So once I pause the video within your table groups, I would like you to intentionally discuss first, what is this chart showing? Come up with a group answer for that, and then come up with a one or two sentence explanation as a group that answers the question, how does the way it organizes information help us to understand it? Hopefully you came up with something about this being a chart that shows different forms of the Hebrew language 
and how the symbols and shapes in that language have evolved and changed over time to become what is known as modern Hebrew. Um, Hebrew is the language spoken in Israel, and large parts of what we know today as the Bible are written in Hebrew, and this shows the evolution of the language over the time and what some of the symbols stand for and represent um, when we read the Hebrew language. If that's what your group came up with, good job. This is a graph. Graphs show things in relation to each other. So in this particular case, you have a graph that shows the world population in millions, which is on the left, and it shows the passage of time on the right. Um, starting with the year 1000 and going up to the year 2000. So that graph actually would probably continue going up if we continued to go to the right. What inferences, judgments, or opinions could we develop based on looking at this graph? Go ahead and discuss that in your table groups and come up with a group answer. Hopefully, you guys decided that the human population started going up at a vastly accelerated rate right around the year 1800. Um, it really started going up after the year 1500, and one of the reasons for that is something called the Columbian Exchange, and that is something we're going to be learning about at the end of the semester. But um, it, the story is told simply by looking at it, and what do you think it means for the future? That's a very powerful question. So we're going to make our own map. Uh, it's going to be a map of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is one of the regions we're going to be studying. You can find a map of Mesopotamia on page 34 of your book. And I'm going to go ahead and explain the assignment. And obviously in class, I'm going to pause this video and explain it in a lot more depth. But if you happen to miss class, this is what the assignment entails. You're going to have to draw a map key. That's the box that has the symbols that tell you what the map says. Uh, you're going to have to have a compass rose, which is the symbol that tells you where north, south, east, and west are. You're going to have to draw longitude and latitude lines with degrees. And that's something that I'm going to have to teach you about in a completely separate lesson. So hold the phone on that one. You're going to have to draw dots that represent cities. And you're going to have to write the name of the city itself. You're going to have to draw rivers, mountains, and bodies of water and label them correctly, which is what number six says. Make sure your cities, your rivers, your mountains, and your bodies of water are all labeled. And since this is going to be a graded assignment, and since I'm going to be giving you a significant amount of time in class to work on it, academic vocabulary, significant, um, it is important that you do your best work. Uh, with that, it is time for you to write your summary at the bottom of your Cornell notes. Uh, you can write one summary at the end of all of the notes, or you can write short summaries at the bottom of each page of your notes. Uh, whichever you choose to do, it is something I will grade when I look at your interactive notebook. And I hope you have enjoyed today's lesson on the basics of social studies. Until next time, this is Mr. Blumendahl. Signing off from the Waldo Social Studies YouTube channel.